This is uh, a newer session for me. Um, I've done it. I've done this session just this year. Um, but I have a video of me doing this session. I've done it about ten times in the Cleveland area um, because this idea of how we use the awesomeness inside workshop for at least for one more year, which is the AIR assessment in Ohio. This is our last year of our contract with AIR, so we'll have to see whether they get a new contract. But every year we need to send a message to kids, hey, one kind of writing that you need to learn how to do is called test-taking writing. Um, and this year, here are the rules for how to do that. Um, and they're different than the rules were three years ago. And they're really different than the rules were five years ago. Um, and so being nimble and smart about this, then great people, if you have kids who will be writing, um, you know, private school essays as eighth graders, that's a different kind of test taking genre. Or you have kids that um, uh, um, want to get a scholarship. Um, that's another kind of uh, testy sort of genre that has a formula and a rhythm to it that you need to know and understand. And it's, it might not be all fair, but that's how it rolls. So, um, so we're going to live in this accountability space for a couple hours together, um, but we're going to try and also live the, the joy and positivity and energy of the uh, writing units at the same time. So we're going to try and do both of those things. Kids are counting on us being able to figure that out. We don't go from joy and then be like, okay, it's test taking time. Put your joy in a box and we'll grab it again in May. Um, uh, we want to actually try and live with fidelity in both spots. So um, I'm Lisa Behe and from Cleveland. I've met several of you um, uh, multiple times. I haven't been around since October, but I'm super excited that not only am I here today and here on March 20th, but Crystal and I are also gonna be in, um, in the schools, in, the, in probably each school between now and March 20th, which is really a tribute to your exit tickets. Because when you share, nicely um, what your hopes and dreams and fears and concerns are our job is to take those and pop them back up to Eric or pop them back up to principals or pop them back and forth amongst each other and say hey there's a trend here I'm going to respond to it so I'm um, thrilled to be back and I'm going to have Crystal introduce herself really fast and then Eric will walk us through a uh, brief opening Good. Thank you. It's good to be back. Um, I was with you guys back in September, so it's been a minute. Um, Crystal Funk, I drove a short drive over from Warsaw, Ohio. My parents really enjoy when I'm here because I come and hang out with them. Um, so really nice to be back. I'm excited to get in schools and get into some of your classrooms and see you in action. Um, and working alongside those partnerships of supporting you and most importantly students and getting them reading and writing and creating this joy around it even though we're running fast in the testing season. So I'm excited for that work that's coming as well. Well, I think you know me, so I'm not going to put too in my background. But um, first of all, I would like to say welcome. I can't stand up who I was, sir. <laughs> That's the only animation I have, by the way. But I was happy I was able to make that. I did want to say thank you for coming out. Happy Valentine's Day. I know this is probably not what you most wanted to do on Valentine's Day. Um, but I assume yesterday was a lot more Valentine's Day than the way this is going right now as far as parties. So hopefully um, you've been enjoying the PP so far that you had. I did want to remind you about this year's theme because the um, DLT met this week and I'm going to give you some updates, but um, we are a district that is really under construction um, beyond just the build house. We are working on a lot of the main topics and I wanted to cover some of those, give you a little bit of an update. and. Um, if I was going to list these three, one deals with our district OIP plan, math curriculum, and the EOA curriculum. 
This is a way that the middle schools kind of talk about implementation about crawl, walk, and run. And this was a lot of that DLT as well. I would say um, you may really feel like they're running, especially with respect to Lucy Calkins. As far as many of the decisions, I think, and I'm going to go through it, we might truly be more in a cross stage with almost all three of the big items that I was describing. And a large part of the reason why is these are three very big decisions that once they are made, um, we want to make sure we're making the right decisions. So um, with the district's OIP, you'll see the why, how, and what. Where the district is right now as far as working on the OIP is we're really back to focusing on the why. Um, trying to establish what is, first of all, um, Mr. Cedar has shared his vision. If you remember the opening day, he talked about his summer um, visit to the model school conference where he talked about Quad D and Bill Daggett. That's part of what the DLT is also talking about. And right now, the DLT is working on developing the vision. Then, once the vision is created, once the why is established, we um, will be working on the how and the what. Math curriculum, we have two pilots that are taking place. Um, Eureka and Ninja Math. My slides got kind of distorted here. The math curriculum team and the pilot teachers, there is a meeting that's scheduled on March 4th, and the DLT will meet after that on March 11th with um, feedback from these committees. I have down here really the range of where these decisions could end up. Um, we could select a, math, a new math program for next year. We could end up going with Go Math. Um, at the far end, or we could be saying we really need to see if there's anything else out there. Um, I can't say a couple things about both ends. One issue with GoMath is it's going away. Um, eventually, we will have to make a decision, so you can only put it off so long. Um, the other thing I can say, first of all, I have gone in and observed um, classrooms of our pilot teachers and our pilot teachers are doing a great job and I've seen some really neat stuff so I'm hopeful that um, we, we are at least looking at some quality when it comes to the pilots but part of the issue that we have with both math and ELA deals with what we are trying to come up with a fix for is that we have a very messed up adoption cycle or years or so forth our um, elementary math program did subscription ended a year before the middle school the middle school was separate from the high school at the elementary our subscription of go math ends just one year before the ela so this makes a very messy situation where last year we reestablished curriculum teams and we're trying to get to a spot where this year we will review math and we'll make a decision as a district with respect to math this other year. And again, I can't even say we'll definitely make that decision this year, but that we can make a um, year of review and decisions as a district with respect to these major subjects. So with respect to Lucy Hawkins, I do want to emphasize it is still supplemental materials. I have been at many of the um, PD sessions and I can say you are learning a lot of tools that I know fit in right now with our journeys curriculum. I think um, one thing I do need to point out, journeys is in the same spot as GoMath, by the way. Um, we can carry that out a little bit longer um, I have sent for quotes for Think Central and so forth, but eventually that goes away as well. And we'll have to make a decision, but we have not really had um, the time to pilot yet. 
They do have a program very similar to how GoMath is replaced to by IntoRead. They have a program called, or IntoMath, they have a program called IntoRead that ties in with it and so forth. That might be something we choose to pilot and look at. We may choose to look at um, some other programs, or we may be finding Lucy Coggins really is the core program we like. However, what other pieces might we need to supplement it with? So your work today, and I know discussions have been happening at buildings, and if they haven't, um, do expect your principal that they are going to start asking you, what are your thoughts about Lucy? What's there, what isn't there? Definitely make sure you share your thoughts with your principals, share your thoughts with your ELT members, and also share your thoughts with your ELA curriculum members because we will start a process of figuring out what are we um, going to do with respect to ELA and that that process will begin. Um, at what, what time will we be able to complete that for ELA? As I was explaining, we have lots of different things to look at and big decisions to make, so it may delay it some. But I hope that provides some clarity with something that actually is not as clear as we wish it would be. But eventually, I think we're going to get into a nice set of process that we can take a look at these big issues. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Um, and I, I think the district did do a very nice gift to everyone when they planned um, President's Day to follow this. So, I would like to say thank you for your hard work, but also remind you it's a three-day weekend, so if you can hang in for a few more hours, I, I think you're going to at least have some time to enjoy. And once again, happy Valentine's Day. I'm going to try to keep my energy up to help us hang in there for a few more hours, too. Thank you. This is, this is hard and important stuff, and it's complicated as well as Eric just acknowledged for us. So. What do we want to get done today? Well, we always want to build a professional community. Well, first thing is we don't want anyone sitting in the front. And then after that, we want to make sure that we build a professional community, um, that we're deepening our knowledge of workshop. Is there anyone who could wake up in the middle of the night and you could tell me what the three parts of workshop are now? Let's just try on our hands, ready? Work, touch, share. Yes, I could wake you up, Julie. Yes, I could. You were confident. Come on, that bright orange mug. Many lesson, work time, share time. So we're just going to keep really reinforcing that, that that's a structure. It supports kids. It supports us. It crosses between reading and writing and the word study stuff that um, Teachers College has created. And I will, you'll hear me. I'm actually making a big shift in my language and in my practice. Um, for a long time, I actually have said like the Calkins material or Lucy this or Lucy that. And I am recognizing, especially um, uh, spending time in New York and uh, spending time in social media, that I'm making that shift to calling it Teachers College Reading and Writing Project. This is not just one person. This is hundreds of staffers, hundreds of schools, a huge online and real-time community doing robust and rich professional learning. It's a dynamic curriculum. It, it keeps living and breathing, even once it shrink wrap and send off to us. So I'm really making that shift. So what we'll be doing today is talking about the alignment between AIR, American Institute for Research. Yes, I do consult for them too, interestingly enough, but on their teacher quality initiatives, not on their um, testing side of the house. Um, and Teachers College Reading Writing Project rubrics. And we're going to try to make connections between those two things, which won't be that hard. So it won't take us forever. Then we'll be getting into grade level groups so that we can dig in further into, so where in the units you're in, or in the units you haven't yet approached, can you find what the experiences of bend here, some anchor charts there, that you want to make sure kids experience before testing happens. Um, I'll just be briefly that that is embedded into the scope and sequence of the curriculum. So when you go to the Reading and Writing Project site, there's an expectation that for your state, you have to be hunkering down in a collegial way with others to think, so 
I happen to coach in Indiana. Indiana has had a different state test the past four years in a row. So we think we're in a crazy state, a different test, and it's always called I something. So like I read, I am reading, I read, I rode, I read, I run. <laughs> no. um, and every so they every year they have to they have to get together around December, um, which is actually when our um, framework for the year was released this year in December as well, um, and say, okay, what does Indiana want to see in student writing this year? And that ability of for us to say like. Yes, we know what good writing is, but I want to teach you this specific genre called how to take the state test. And it is different than last year, so let me help you figure out how to do that. Um, you guys are lucky in writing. Um, your rubrics have been around, this is the fourth year. Um, the 612 rubric, so we're just a heartbeat away, this is only the second year for their rubrics, because their rubrics were revised but after testing in 2018. So in 2019 was their first year with their slightly revised writing rubrics. And this, so this will be the second year the teachers have seen their rubrics you know, for the whole school year to be able to use them around writing instruction. This is hard. It's hard not to sort of be, excuse my French, but like bitchy about the whole thing. Be like, how am I supposed to be responsive and cheerful and energetic around this with the kids when it's an ever-changing target? Well, we're not as bad as some states. It's easier for us when you see a sixth or seventh or eighth or twelfth grade person, you can high five them because they are only in year two with their writing rubrics. And we can help each other. That first norm. We can build it on professional community that we're helping each other get this done. So developing your questions and wonderings and then also sharing out what's working for you is super important. So the hearts are on there, not for Valentine's Day, although I told the morning session, um, kudos to everyone who has a new love and you're like going home to candy and flowers and maybe some diamond earrings. Because um, what I hope I'm going home to is an empty dishwasher. Happy Valentine's Day! We have to do the dishwasher for you. Um, so, but actually it's not for me about Valentine's Day. It's a reminder that this curriculum, this belief system that undergirds this teaching is about relationships. Your relationships with your readers and writers, how you build a community of readers and writers. So when you bring those kids to the rug for a mini lesson, it's not with side eye, it's with joy and understanding and excitement. Um, but it's also about the relationships we have with each other. This curriculum is not lone wolf curriculum. It says time and time again, please be sure that you are in a professional learning community, looking at student work, asking each other's questions, seeing each other's mini lessons. That's part of implementing this. It's not meant for people who want to go ride solo. It is really meant for folks who want to live in a community where, where professionals are digging in, rolling up their sleeves, not just, as I say to my teenager, you are a great problem identifier, and I'm really interested in you working those problem-solving skills as well. And I can say the same thing sometimes in educator workshops. We are great at identifying problems, but no one wants to actually go on the Facebook group and post their question. We just want to complain about it. No one wants to be like, oh, should I email the third grade team at the other school and see what they're doing? You know, so I want to get this out of any wallowing that we might have and instead get us excited to be like, whoa, this is hard and it really stinks to be a third grader PS, by the way, in Ohio. So let me bring some joy and positivity and energy to it. A lot of love. So here's what we're going to spend time doing. We'll have about 45 minutes, maybe slightly more, going through the checklist. And we're going to divide crystals, take the third grade upstairs to the library, fourth grade, you'll stay down here with me. We'll go deeper into the Lucy check, to the teacher's college reading and writing project checklist. And we'll think about the units we're teaching, and we'll actually think about where we need more at-bats 
with and for kids practicing. So thinking about tools like Common Ed and UCLA, they can help us give kids more opportunities to do the kind of testy things. As I like to say, um, you can't plank for three minutes on the first day of planking. If you can, I don't want to be friends with you. No, I'm just kidding. If you can, more power to you. Um, but what we have to do is grow our stamina in doing that work, and we need to give kids plenty of at bats doing this as well. So let's do a quick turn and talk. Let's bring a lot of love and positive energy in the world. I want you to think about a particular reader, a kid. Like, I want you to name their name. So hold that kid in your head. You want a, some success stories. You want to flood the room with joy about a kid who's maybe gone from, no, I'm not even going to cue you up. A kid who's, who's making progress as a reader. OK. OK, turn behind you or diagonal from you. Don't turn to the person next to you, though. So uh, I will pull tall, hence the name tags. But why do we start with success stories in a PD that's about state testing? Why do we start here? Casey. Uh, <laughs> why, why would I have you do this? We have so much urgency about the test. Shouldn't I just like jump right into the rubrics? Why would I why would I have a start with this prompt? Starting on the more positive note. Starting on a positive side, can I add more to that? And go our readers more the book. End goal of readers reading more. Yeah, is, that like, is that on the same test? Really How many books have you read this year? Is that on the same test? No, it's not on the same test. So, so I'm interested in your readers and in us valuing readers in more holistic ways than just the AIR assessment. You are a second language learner and you did not speak at the beginning of the year. I overheard someone in the back of the room saying, she's still a low reader, but she has so much more confidence. Right? Julie, did I hear you saying something? Go ahead. Yeah, one day. You're fourth and fifth grade teachers. If that's the first day you get your period, that kid is not going to do as well on the test. Or if they miss breakfast and they somehow fall through the cracks and they don't get that free breakfast and something happens. Or if we stress them out. If we have built it up in such a way that we wrap their identity or our belief in them into how they do on this test, that's going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy of stress, not I can do my best work. When we break out into groups, we will talk. You guys have heard me say this before. How many of you teach kids who bring trauma or anger or hunger or pain to school? Raise your hand. Okay, hands down. How many of you take one minute, four times a day, and practice deep breathing? Right. I want that idea of us saying to kids, you need to calm down. Even when we say it nicely, oh, you need to calm down. But kids need rehearsal at what it means to calm down. So set your darn timer four times a day and build in a mindfulness minute and say to kids, ah, I've done something really terrible. I've been asking you guys to calm down and I'm realizing we never once practiced or talked about how you calm down when you're super stressed out. And I had a humongous fight with my teenager, and she said to me, you need to calm down. And I realized how terrible it feels. And so I'm going to build this time in. It's a new job in our classroom. When the timer goes off, you need to remind me. I'm going to teach us four ways to calm down, one in each way for the next, uh, always on Tuesdays. And in a month, we'll have four great ways to calm down, and your radar will be really on for that. And he asks if you know any calming down experts or books on calming down, bring them in so we can talk about this. Like, we have to teach kids that when they're on their computer taking the same test, they can close their eyes, count to 10, 
look away from the screen, open their eyes off the screen, focus on something, and then move back to the screen. If kids haven't learned how to do that from you, they're not going to be magically doing that. Yet that is the kind of activity that helps kids build the stamina they need. We do it. We're writing something. We don't write constantly for 28 minutes and then flip our laptops down and go done. We move away, we stretch, we shift our bodies, we count to five, we check our phones. You know, they can't do that, but we have to give them strategies to deal with the stress and strain of this, and we need to not think that they know these things already. So we have to change to help them. Let me say that one more time. We're the ones that need to be doing that shifting. We want to see kids holistically, we want to be there for them to help detox the stress and lift up the love, lift up the calm, lift up the I believe in you. So we've got a lot of work to do in these, in these stretch of weeks. So how many folks feel like they are like a six, a seven, an eight, a nine, or a 10 out of 10 in understanding pretty well what's on the AIR assessment in writing? Who would say they're like a four or a five? Okay, so we're going to try and get as many people up to like seven, eight, and nine today as we can. So, I'm sure that most people know this, that first kids take the reading test, and then they take the writing prompt, and it's based on the same stimulus, i.e. passages. Who puts the word stimulus in these things? Um, but passages. Um, and then students have to provide a text-based response, i.e. write. Um, in which, uh, an essay in which they present or analyze information or support an opinion. There is the left side range for third and fourth grade, but that second paragraph reminds us that the writing prompts are usually to the easier passages on the test. So, in the third grade test, the stimulus, I guess stimuli, Okay. Um, can run from 420 to 820 in the left side range. But the state of Ohio creates the writing prompts for the lower left side passages, not the higher left side passages. Okay? That's how it's written. Page three of the blueprint that came out in December 2019, which is the same as the blueprint of 2018 as well. So this, this part is. How many people knew that already? No. This is great news for kids. That means we can actually say to kids, when you take the AIR test and lots of tests, passages will feel really easy and other passages will feel really hard. Great news that I don't think every kid in Ohio knows. When you have to write about your reading to share your thinking, Oftentimes that would be the easier thing that you read, which means it might be shorter and it won't stress you out as much. So you might even have time to go back and skip it. Not everyone knows that, but now we know it. Doesn't that make you feel a little less stressed out? Yeah, it makes me feel less stressed out too. You can actually say that to the kids, because it's true. It's not a thing. So as you're pulling up sample things for kids to do, you should really be thinking about passages that feel at least slightly accessible, as opposed to the hardest passages, because when they actually take the test, they'll be writing about reading, writing to the stimulus on the passages that are more in that lower range rather than the higher range. The lower half of the, of the left sound range, not the higher half of the left sound range. And we should say that to kids. And if you have apprehensions about saying it to kids because then they'll slack off or then they'll think it's too easy, you have to frame it as knowledge. I've got a tip for you. I have new info that I learned that I want to share with you. 
Okay? Do a really quick turn to talk to the person sitting next to you and just share digesting that information and what implication it might have for your teaching. So maybe the first, first step is I learned, and the second step is I'm going to try or I'm going to talk to my kids about or I need to. Okay? Just turn to talk for a minute. One minute. So a group of two, please. Choose literature at their exile range. Say it a little louder. Choose literature at their exile range that we want and then in there. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not just what we find on Reworks or New Zilla, but when we go on Common Lit or when we look at um, literature passages, both of those can, um, can we can tighten the lexile range that we're using all together, but we can also know why am I having them practice right about reading to things that they can't really read? You know, now in Ohio, we've actually thought about that. Like, we can moan and groan all we want, but this is actually pretty good news for kids. Because, dare I ask, what percent of a kid's ELA score is their writing? No, it's 25%. We should all know that. The multiple choice and other pieces are 75% of the kids' grade, and writing is 25% of the kids' grade. So there are about um, 21 standards in the 75%, and then there's four standards that are 25%. So you want to raise a kid's score? Improve their writing. That's very, a very powerful way to get stronger impact. So when you look at the blueprint, there, uh, there's about 30 points of multiple choice and click and drag and, you know, all these parts. And then there's 10 points for writing. This is really powerful for us to know this and for kids to know why we're spending so much time thinking about this. Okay. The state of Ohio doesn't just look at lexile level. They also use qualitative measures to understand the passage, and they stay away from controversial issues. However, they actually try, strive to choose passages for the argument writing that are truly passages that share both sides of the argument. Stimuli for the opinion argument prompts should present opposing points of view, and each point of view should be equally rep represented. Sorry, that cut paste behind me here. So that a student can take either side of the position. That means that when you're helping your kids prep for argument writing, you need to carefully think about whether that piece has pro and con in the same article. That's really important. Not, we should all wear uniforms, we should not wear uniforms. That's not how Ohio, now, of course we're still going to read stuff like that. Of course we still need to know how to read a piece that's for cell phones and a piece that's against cell phones. But in Ohio, the stimulus for the AIR, the passage, should present both points of view in the same piece and in equal measure. So you can say to your kids, when you're reading an opinion piece, you should be making a T-chart in your head. And on one side of the T-chart is one side of the argument, and on the other side of the T-chart is the other. And if you're having trouble making that T-chart in your head, put it on the piece of paper. <laughs> Don't give them a printout of a T-chart. That won't work. Teach them how to fold a white piece of paper into half and make their own T-chart so that they learn how to do that when they're reading one article. And if your kids don't know how to do that already, teach them how. When we know better, and this is, again, this is this year's guidance. 
with Ann Arbor. I don't know if this will change, and Ohio will say next year, we want kids reading two passages and we want clearly a right answer that we're driving kids for in the opinion pieces. But that's not where we are right now. Right now, we know that kids need to be able to read a pro, an article that's pro and con in the same stimulus. And that means, almost without fail, that their ability to teach art is going to help them write a better argument. Yeah. So, I know we're not supposed to look at the test, but I thought there was more than one reading, more than one passage for the writing. Is that right? Yeah. So, in, on the state test, the information pieces don't have a stimulus number. I don't have guidance on what those should look like. And it also doesn't tell us that there could be three passages on how cameras work. Here's how digital, here's how, I'm trying to think what they are, these are either the fourth or the fifth. Here's how paywall cameras work. Here's how digital cameras work. Here's how photography, photography is valuable in society. And then it could be and explain how cameras have changed over time prompt. Or it could be, and there's a con to how photography, oh, plenty of reasons why how photography is negative, cell phones, something like that. That could live there too. So kids need to know there's rarely going to be some sort of Venn diagram scenario for them. But T charts are golden for third, fourth, and fifth graders right now in Ohio. Like this is really helpful knowledge for us to know and pay forward. Um, so now that's guidance on what the stimulus will look like. How do we grade student work in Ohio? So I'm actually gonna start with Ohio rubric. So 10 points, as I said. Four points on purpose, focus, and organization. We do not, well, first off, who grades kids' writing in Ohio? Computers. Right, computers. So these scores are not individual. They're holistic scores. So you don't get 0.8 points for all of those things. In Ohio, there's a holistic four-point score for purpose, focus, and organization. Now, I'm a confused mind on this. Part of me does want to tell kids, computers are amazing. In fact, they're so amazing in Ohio, <laughs> computers are reading your state test. Computers are our friend. Um, and then on the other hand, I want to say, listen, this might feel a little bit like a downer, but since human beings are reading this, but computers are, if you follow some of these rules, you'll help the computer know how to give you a higher score. So I'm not sure which philosophy to take, but I know it should be, if you don't get this right, the computer's gonna give you a score, and I'm not gonna be here to save you, <laughs> right? So we have to find a way to talk about the fact that in our state right now, this year, we were even chatting about this, we are like, what have you seen, what have you seen in the test manuals that computers are still doing this work. So we have a holistic four points on purpose, focus, and, and organization, a holistic four points on evidence and elaboration, which includes evidence, elaboration techniques, clear and effective ideas, vocab, and varied sentence structure. Notice that varied sentence structure lives in evidence and elaboration, not conventions. Okay, so they see that as craft. And then conventions at the end, punctuation, capitalization, sentence formation, spelling. Conventions are only worth two points. The other two are worth four. So obsessing over conventions doesn't pay off with very much points. But learning how to organize your essay can move you both from a two to a three and a two to a four. So you have to really think, 
gosh, I really, you know, when a computer grades your essays, it's way better to have good periods in there, but I don't know if I'm going to totally freak out about the spelling. Right? So this is how the state of, this is, sorry, this year, right now, how the state of Ohio thinks about this. P.S., the 6th through 12th grade rubric is organized the exact same way. These three criteria, of course, a big difference in the 6th through 12th grade is that when you aren't writing an opinion, you're writing an argument, and you're required to have a counterclaim. Um, so that's a big shift that you see in the rubrics when you get to the 6th, 12th. So 5th grade folks, you should really be chatting out with 6th grade folks about that because they can't be the first ones to teach that. So now I'm going to shift to back to Lucy's. Oh, to teacher's college. So here's what every genre, every grade level, kindergarten through five, kindergarten actually through eight. So as you're thinking about like, is this good for kids? What curriculum makes sense? This is one of the most important golden nuggets in teacher's college curriculum. And that's that we talk about student writing the same way we do in kindergarten, the same way we do in third grade, the same way we do in fifth grade, the same way we do in eighth grade. So we talk about elaboration with kindergarten. The checklist that you have, they have that same criteria. Three big buckets, structure, development, and conventions. Structure is worth five points graded along these individual criteria. The overall effectiveness of the piece, a strong lead, transitions, your ending, and how it's organized. Development only has two criteria, elaboration and craft, but when you're scoring student writing, and you guys know this because you've spent days and days in the Writing Pathways book, you double that score when you're giving kids points for their work. So a piece of Lucy Calkins' work is actually worth, even though there's only nine criteria, it's worth 11 points. And I put that in parentheses because if you're scoring stuff out of nine, you need to stop, hit pause, and recognize that you should be doubling the points for development in order to get an accurate picture, a balanced picture of that kid as a writer. Uh, Teachers College also values conventions, but at the same weight the state of Ohio does, about 20% of the score, not 50%, 20 percent 20 of the score is how kids do with dominant and punctuation. So now I'm going to put these two criteria next to each other so that we can see on the left-hand side is the, is the teacher's college rubric. Structure, which includes lead and transition and ending and organization and the overall feel of the piece, is the same thing as purpose, focus, and organization in the same rubric. Development, which is elaboration and craft, is the same thing as Evidence and elaboration on the state rubric. And conventions is the same thing as conventions on the state rubric. And in fact, not only is the language incredibly similar, we'll peek into it in a minute, so is the point structure. So it's not like Teachers College believes that if you feel good about writing, you get a higher score, which is not realistic for the state of Ohio, which doesn't care how you feel. Like, teachers, college, the checklist, or the rubric, is almost identical to the state of Ohio's criteria. So, turn to talk to your partner about what you just learned about the alignment around these two pieces. What do you notice about it? What surprises you? What confirms what you already know? And then if that feels boring, go ahead and talk about what this means for your teaching. We'll talk for about three minutes this time. Um, one thing that came up in one of the groups that I was working on is um, 
Uh, so what are some of the skills that we want kids to learn? And we talked about the, the tension of computer grading and needing to, kids needing to have these two very specific skills, citing text evidence and paraphrasing. And that we should all be on the same page that we're teaching that. And we should know which, in which units they learn how to do that. And I popped up for a minute, and you'll see these in our small groups. Like, this is a really awesome fourth grade um, uh, text evidence anchor chart um, that all, you know, it's just a, it's with the um, picture book Fox, which is a really powerful text. Um, but it gives kids both the stems and it gives kids direction. And if kids saw this chart in third grade, because we popped it into third, and then they did a whole unit on it in fourth, and then we reviewed it again in fifth, kids would be like, oh, thank God you guys are finally getting your act together and being consistent about what you want me to do as a writer now. Instead of somebody has a hamburger and somebody has an acronym and somebody has a stoplight and somebody has a finger, a hand. Like, we, you know, what matters more? A race paragraph, the hand paragraph, the hamburger paragraph? Like, this is hard. I, that's not really fair. So this is why one of the pluses of the units is consistency of message to kids about what we value in your writing. Um, another group that I talked to realized we don't know, does the state of Ohio care about a space after a period? Do they care about indenting? Like, I don't think so. Someone's like, you can't even use the tab bar in the AIR test. If you want to indent, you have to go space, 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 space. So it's like, so why would I spend any, like, I care about indenting, but this is crazy, you guys. The state of Ohio, for some reason, doesn't. You know, once we can confirm that or once we can agree that that's not going to be worth the time and energy and effort. And how many of us know kids that will spend their time doing this instead of thinking about what they're going to write? So we can start to coalesce around some ideas that we find out are truths and then say, guys, this year, and it's, how many times are you going to hear me say this year? Because honestly, we're on year three of a three-year um, contract with AIR. So do not teach the kids that this is forever, because it may not be. So this year, as we learn how to practice this test, there are some really funky typing rules. In the same way you guys are able to learn every rule for a video game, <laughs> you are going to be able to learn the rules for taking the AIR test on a computer. This is brilliant. Maybe I'll even make a dance about it. Um, <laughs> anything else that people noticed about this? Doesn't it feel comforting that the Calkins rubric, ugh, that the Teachers College rubric is so similar to the state rubric? And if we're using this rubric in chess list in kinder and first and second and third, Kids will be like, pish posh, I've been elaborating forever. And that way, when we grow our writers, not only can we have better conversations, but they can feel better about the work they're doing. OK, so yes. Um, we were talking in the back corner. I think it's also super important that you address with students the difference of the audience that this writing piece is going to. So we teach kids in writer's workshop that they are the author and they're creating a story or a piece for an audience. And a lot of times, not a lot of times, all the time we teach them that it's their craft and it's their piece of writing. And there are times that they don't follow typical rules. When they're writing for state testing, the audience that they're writing for is looking for that stuff. So we want to let them know that. They need to know that they should write the best proper English that they can. They should avoid all the extra slang and texting language that we tell them is fine in their writing because the audience is different. But we have to, to talk in that and we have to let kids know that. Um, that when they are writing for the state test, it's a different genre. They are writing for this very special audience and we want to make sure that we're setting them up for success and showing that audience all the amazing things that they know to do right for state testing. 
There's no E.E. E. Cummings on the state test. <laughs> We're not interested in that, in that, you know, in that all the creativity that we value and nurture, we're like, we're not getting rid of it. We're just working some different muscles. And when you go to apply it for a job, this is really going to help you. And when you write your grandma, who's not interested in texting language, this is really going to help you. And when you have to write a persuasive letter to the principal about chocolate milk, this is really going to help you. So helping them up their formal language game. We can see it as a burden. Or we can lure them into like, this is fabulous. I can't believe we're getting to learn how to write for computers. Like we can lift it up as an opportunity as well. So we are going to um, divide into grade level groups. And we're going to talk about four things. How do we build kids' confidence? What are the ways we're tending to the social emotional? We've already been trying to pop a lot of that in. How do we articulate what kids are already doing well? and then really be clear that our language is telling them, we're good, we're so amazing at A and B and C. We're gonna learn how to do D and E and F, and let me tell you what that pathway will look like. We're gonna talk about two key words that should already be prevalent in our teaching, and if they're not, we're gonna to wanna to make this shift as soon as Tuesday. And that's talking about how long can you write for? How are you building your writerly stamina? And how much are you writing? What's your volume of writing? And then last, we'll do a bit of personal planning and team planning to think, where are places where you and your colleagues can work? Remember, collegiality matters here. Across the day, across the week together, to help kids out. We'll share a couple examples and ideas that we have, but we hope that you will leave here and go to the art teacher, to the librarian, or to the PE teacher, to your special ed colleague if they're not here, and say, listen, I'm getting in the zone in a super positive way, and I'm wondering if I could give you these three anchor charts, talk with you about them, and have you just sneak it in, because the kids love you, Mr. Gym teacher or Ms. Art teacher. And if they could see you doing this, I think it would just wake their eyes and ears up in a way that I'm not always able to do. OK, so those will be the four pushes we do as we break into grade level groups. Um, third grade folks. Wait, am I forgetting the schedule? No. Third grade folks are headed upstairs. That's right. Third grade folks are headed upstairs with Crystal. We're going to take about a 10-minute um, break. So let's say that we're all in our spaces at uh, 120. 120. Uh, so you write a grant for a project, and you can then post it. Instead of people at your church who are just like, oh, what you do is such important work. And you can be like, oh, thank you. You know, I have a project up on donors' shoes right now. If you or anyone in, in your family wants to make a quick donation. We were told we're not allowed to do that anymore. Well, these folks are not allowed to do it. Eric, do you know where people are allowed to do donors' shoes or only certain schools are allowed to do donors' shoes? That's <laughs> great. Yeah, it's awesome. So clearly there are some people doing it. So, um, so you just write a little blurb. My classroom is energetic and I love it. And I teach at a Title I school in Ohio. And the CISA will help my kids interact and create a little budget that gets um, approved. So, oh, almost you have a sweets and sodas um, donated. Isn't that nice? And top person, whoever he is. So, um, so this is, uh, this is just a great resource, DonorsChoose.org. Find out if you're allowed to use it. Um, and you'll be able to, um, they've helped 39 million kids so far with projects. And every so often, um, someone will come fund every literacy project under $500 in all of America. Um, Stephen Colbert funded every project like one year on August 15th because he wanted everyone to have a good back to school. Yeah, um, Craig Farrell has also fun, uh, funded them very generously as well. So take a look. 
or maybe it's more of a don't ask, don't tell scenario. Um, but in my opinion, one of the things that donors choose is so awesome for is um, is recognizing like, hey, I don't have a lot of. Um, oops, I'm not sharing that. Um, I don't have a lot of. Um, mysteries and this class loves mysteries or i have a super i have a lot of athletic boys who hate reading and so i want all the jake maddox books i want to want four copies of all the jake maddox books so yes you can write a grant for like 1500 but you can do these little ones for 250 or 300 that like you know fund more quickly and then the more you get funded is the uh, more you get lifted up in like their um their uh their social media donors choose does an excellent job so uh, we give money to them so i got it i got a ten dollar <coughs> card on my birthday and it was like good for 36 hours and of course i went i was for 54 bucks because i was 54 years old creepy the donors choose knows that but then i was like Oh my gosh, this project only needs 70 more dollars. So, you know, I went from 54 and I thought I could take 16 of my own to finish paying it, which is why I bet I got a $10 one. Happy Valentine's Day. If you love a classroom, you know, here's 10 bucks. And chances are I'm going to be like, oh, I can't just give them my $10 gift card and give them a stitch more. So they prey on people like me who want good things to happen. But, um, my husband's company does a dress down day. All the money goes to Donors Choose Projects and CMS in Cleveland Metropolitan School District. So everything they raise on this dress down, there's four people, they call the projects. They decide if they want to give, you know, all 1,500 to one project, or they want to pick 10 projects and give them 150 each. So lots of corporations on board with this, you know, made super famous, I think, by that Stephen Colbert thing a few, that's maybe four years ago now. Oh boy, was that an Oprah moment. I still kind of think that maybe someday Oprah will do that too. She just seems to be far, far enough past Stephen Colbert doing it. Okay, so we are going to go find the, where we are on the PowerPoint. There we are. Okay, so I want to start with um, confidence building tasks. And I do want you to, um, we'll get to the highlighters in a minute, but I do want you to jot down a few notes somewhere about this because. Um, I'm going to use sherry, like the drink. No, I, was, I, I couldn't remember yet, like the drink. Um, so sherry supports ELL kids. And the message, the confidence building message that she needs to give her kids, let's work this through as if we're partners. What do you think your kids need to hear in, in order to prepare for the test? Like what's something you could say to them that would be true and build their confidence? Well, that they can do it. There's no yeah. reason why they can't do it, even if they yeah. are not through it anyway. Right. So this test is tricky because it's all in English, but we've been working so hard, there's going to be whole big parts of it that you're ready for. Right? Okay. Now, that may only be pseudo true, right? But that's the kind of message that when we're being explicit about our teaching, I don't want to leave it to luck. I actually don't even want, sorry for anyone who's been teaching as long as I have, and I'm not a big fan of repeating his song lyrics, but has anyone been teaching so long as you know the song? I believe scores can fly. <laughs> I believe scores can touch the sky. Like, I don't want a OST pep rally. <laughs> That, to me, is not a great use of time. I'd rather take all the time and energy that goes into that and buy me some snacks instead. <laughs> um, this idea that we're, we need to message to individual kids who, and, your thir and the third graders know they didn't pass, you know, and you might have some fourth graders who are like, oh, I know this, I've taken it nine times already, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that the messaging, the confidence building message that that kid needs is different than a group of kids who are already confident and are just like, oh, please, let's just get this stupid thing over with. So I want you to spend a minute thinking about who needs a confidence building message in your class, like Sherry and I just did for her, for her ELs, and what that confidence building message, 
What language? Authentic and real language. This can't be pressureful and it can't be too filled with lies. What language do your kids need to hear? And I actually want you to jot down what you might say to that to an individual kid or to a whole class. What are the confidence building messages you need? Do your kids need to hear that you believe in them? Do your kids need to hear that like this is hard but we're tougher? Is your class already called the Lions? And so you want to somehow work like we're going to roar into this task prep in some way. You know, think about what you need to say. So I'm going to give us 60 seconds of personal time, <coughs> absolute silence for that one minute, and then we're going to share with partner. Writing some of those things down, turn and talk to a person next to you. And I want to double check as you do this, that you think about who the subject of your sentences are. Are all of your statements I statements? Can some of them be we statements? Can some of them be we're going to statements? Can some of them be you statements? Really empowering the kids. So cheerleading matters. I believe in you. But I'm also looking for some specific things we can say to kids that are about their actual preparation that helps build their confidence, okay? Just three minutes to talk. Find a couple partners and lean in. What might you say to kids? Okay, so let me just pull us together. Just stay where you are for a second. Here are some things that I... Um, that I overheard or even edited and revised as we were in here. This is now in our PowerPoint, but let's see if we can add any more. This might feel like hard work, but we're ready for it. I see some kids feel frustrated. Let's practice some strategies for when the test feels really hard. We have a game plan. Let me show it to you and let's work on it together. Like kids might actually want to see the calendar and see like, what, what you guys are doing each day. We're talking about gifted kids that carry their anxiety with them. Um, I feel anxious too. How can we take good care of each other? We're gonna learn four ways to show what we know and then you'll have these deep in your brain when we take the test. You're totally figuring out that the reading and the writing is super connected. Do you see how these are like even if they're half-truths, <coughs> maybe what you want to say is like, I've said 5,000 times that the reading and writing are super connected. Um, you haven't gotten it yet, and I'm ready to wring your neck. No, um, but, but you're just flipping like some of this into, some of what your, your teaching points might be into a slightly more SEL confidence building, acknowledging feelings or tensions, but also sort of saying, instead of saying like, it's all right to feel nervous, which is okay to say, you're providing a bit of an antidote to that. It's all right to feel nervous. Let's practice that, let's commit to practicing our breathing every day, right? Like, instead of like, it's okay to be nervous, Mm, yeah, except I want you to do, like, unless you're going to flip that nervousness into positive energy, like, you really need to say, let's, let's make sure we also know how to calm down. And we do, because we've been practicing our breathing. So we're trying to take what we say and build and use confidence building language to support the kids. Other great things that you, you either thought of or you're like, this person, I'm totally stealing this. Any other great phrase? <coughs> so I see her. Go. Share it. Too late. You got caught, Holly. <laughs> um, I love telling you, you are the best reader and writer right now that you've ever been. <gasps> and I said, and he's like, you're the smartest you've ever been right now in this moment you have this. And not only that, we're going to be nine days smarter by the time April 1st comes along, right? Like, what is that song? There's a song, I love, I love you more today than yesterday, ba -ba -ba, but not as much as 
tomorrow. Because it's like, you're better. I, I, I love you so much, and I will love you more tomorrow, which blows my mind. And that, that same premise is true for their reading skills. I love that, Holly. I'm glad you shook her and you were like, share it, Holly, share it. I'm gonna share it. Uh-huh. Anybody else hear anything good? Nope, just bad things. No, I'm just kidding. Everyone's, okay, it's okay. It's Friday on a three-day weekend at 140. I don't know who the heck planned PD for now. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so. Um, the next thing I want to make sure we talk about, where's number two, is brightening the lines. We want to really articulate for kids what they can already do, what they're going to learn to do, and the path to get there. So the first thing I want us to do is to look at the checklist. And you actually have two checklists I want you to be confident with. The OST checklist which I, can I borrow this for one second? Nope, nope, nope. Uh, which is on page two here. So here's the blueprinty stuff right here about the passages. I just wanted you to see those samples. But this is the OST checklist. I just took the four, the four, and the two. The four, the four, and the two for um, in, uh, information writing and opinion writing, okay? So this is just the highest criteria. This is the criteria that describes the best score. I definitely want you to read this with a highlighter and figure out what are some key words that you haven't been saying, that you might want to say. Like, we call a thesis statement a controlling idea in Ohio. But we actually need kids to know that a thesis and a main idea and a controlling idea and a gist statement and the big thought and the main point those are all synonyms for the exact same thing. And we should have an anchor chart up in our classroom that says that. Like there's so many ways to say thesis. And when you read something, the author has a thesis. And when you write something, you make a thesis. Or a main idea, or a point, or a gist. So that's really good for us to name for kids. So the fact that we call it a controlling idea on the state rubric is both interesting and probably something we need to make sure that our kids know as well. Um, so I want you to read through a pen in hand. I also want, and then um, I want you to grab the checklist for from the writing units. So if you have the handout, the opinion writing and the information writing, um, we're both there, but if handouts were gone, which I think a lot of people took extras, they're right here in the Writing Pathways book. Th these are the checklists right out of our Writing Pathways book. They're nothing special. They're just the Writing Pathways checklist. You have the big spiral bound Writing Pathways book as well. So let's do about four minutes of just reading with a highlighter. Making sure you are circling words, that you're laying the rubrics next to each other, that you're really confident about what's in these. Also lifting up when we teach writing in the units of study. But you're probably noticing the vocabulary differences, and it's really important for us to notice, you know, the state gets to decide how they ask questions, and we get some release items from them every year. And the first two pages is the, um, can I grab yours again, Matt? I'm sorry. You've got the state rubric here, but the first two pages have that have the sample questions of how the state asks the writing prompts, right? So the state says, write a multi-paragraph response that explains. And then it says, be sure to include blah, blah, blah. And that be sure to include list um, at least in the 6 through 12, where there's more released items than we have in 3, 4, and 5, this has remained pretty consistent. So this be sure to include section is something that you can lean into a little bit. But one of the things that I want you to notice as we always um, start, uh, start to do this work is that as a, um, as a state, we value um, that content-specific vocabulary, 
you know, and then we don't call that out as a bullet on the reminders list. So it means, as for your class, after you've read a piece on ReadWorks about the American Revolution, you might need to say to your kids, okay, take a minute, grab five post-it notes, and if you were gonna write about this piece, what are five important words you really wanna make sure you had in there? Revolution, Tea Party, Musket, Red Coat, co Colony, I wish I knew five words about the American Revolution. Um, but really helping kids recognize, like, that's awesome. After you guys read something, you don't have to know the definition of all of those things, but you know, whoa, those are important words. Wow, your like, brain is able to sort of, even if you don't have a highlighter, you kind of know the words you'd be highlighting if you were reading this with a highlighter. That's just what good readers do. Like, that's what the state of Ohio needs kids to do especially because computers grade this. And so the repetition of the key words or the content-specific vocabulary is a way for you know, kids to show, rather than just saying British soldier, and if the article says redcoats, I worry that they'd be looking for the word redcoats in there, right? So showing kids like, we, 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 when we become an expert on something, we learn the language of that domain. So if you were going to teach me how to play Fortnite, it has its own special language. What are the most important Fortnite words? What are the most important cheer words? What are the most important soccer words? Well, when we read for the test, your brain is thinking, what are the most important words about what I read? And then you want to use some of those words when you write about what you've read. Because this year, Ohio values that, <laughs> right? So when you know the rubric well, you can be lifting some of these skills and strategies up in a five minute segment. You can put that as a homework. You can, you know, you can be like, read this, there's a box at the bottom, put in eight, five to eight words you think are important. Oh, there's a sub, read this. There's a box at the bottom. What does it mean when there's a box in the bottom? That's why you put the vocab words in. You know, it can be a do now, it can do a homework, it can be there's a sub. It can be find articles for each other and try and see, you know, tonight's homework, courtesy of Marianne, you brought in a great article. You know, so make, you know, try and bring that joy factor as well. But once we know the rubrics better, we're able to teach to the rubric this year in ways that are confidence building and reinforcing the things that kids need to get good at. Okay, I also want to have us spend a little bit of time in our current unit that we're teaching. So some of us might not be teaching a unit of study right now, and some of you may be. So to help make this happen, I'm also gonna put up on the board um, on the screen, four really awesome units inside the units of study that have amazing mentor texts, anchor charts, and the submitting lessons. If you teach fifth grade, you should be running to one of your fourth grade colleagues and saying, can I please see that literary essay unit? Because I just want your anchor charts. I just want to teach Ben one. It doesn't matter that your kids are fifth graders. You can still teach Ben one with a fourth grade literary essay. It's really awesome. If you're teaching third grade and you're worried that your, your kids don't get what an essay is, and you're not scheduled to teach the art of information writing, and you're not sure if you're going to do it, you want to peek into that and see what's there to help my writers become stronger using workshop structure, something that we've been committed to. So I'm going to put about 8,000 post-it notes in the middle, and if you're a post-it note person, it can often help to sort of tag up some good lessons, but I'm going to acknowledge what many people might want to do as a first step is make sure that you have registered for the third and the fourth 
and the fifth grade units online because that's where all the anchor charts are. So I want you to make sure that you have a third and fifth. And if you don't, do it right here while you have access to those unit ones and you can register the units. Um, so where can you find great content to help kids prepare for the AIR test inside the units of study? Here are some of the places where that great content lives. So let's spend about 15 minutes in work time thinking about how we might cultivate the mini lesson list, the anchor charts, the mentor text, the scope and sequence, a bend, and commandeer it to help improve our kids' outcomes on the test. Remember, you're not making a 29-day commitment to this. You can make a five-day commitment to it, just one bend, after you've looked and perused what's there. And I'll butterfly around continuing to answer questions in conference with people, too. I say, whoa, there's something here that I could be using. Or you guys did that in fourth grade. We should build on that in fifth grade. Or, oh, gosh, I hadn't planned to teach that yet. I need to go to that. So fifth grade teacher was just saying, saying to me, you know, I'm an intervention specialist and my, the fourth graders love boxes and bullets and I need to bring boxes and bullets up into fifth grade for some of my struggling writers, right? I mean, I literally hold boxes and bullets in my head all the time now. Like, let me tell you three reasons why you should, I do grant writing as some of my butt and seeds job. So let me tell you three reasons why you should fund this project. The first reason you should fund it is this. Detail, detail. And the second reason why you should fund it is this. Detail, detail. Like boxes and bullets like a life skill. It's great to know forever. And we can teach kids that they can do that work on the fly. You know, that it doesn't require days. Um, in fact, I'm going to name something really important. <coughs> Every single unit encourages you to have kids write a process piece of writing. And some units, they write two or three process pieces. One at the first bend, one at the second bend, one at the third bend. The other kind of writing that human beings need to do is on-demand writing. And at the end of the unit, we ask kids to write one on-demand piece. Your kids should know that the state test isn't process writing, it's on-demand writing. And it's, a, it's kind of a bummer, because we can't talk to each other, you don't get to brainstorm with a friend, there's no post-it notes involved or anchor charts, but you know a lot about on-demand writing. And in fact, your kids don't feel like they know a lot about on-demand writing, you may want to create some really high success on-demand writing experiences for them. Pick any book, fourth graders, from kindergarten, first or second, and write three sentences about your favorite book from when you were little. Then being able to do that on an index card sends them the message like, you can write a literary essay? Look at how much you were able to tell me about No David. Look at how much you were able to tell me about Cat in the Hat. And you can even have the book in front of you. You are already able to do on-demand work. I'm gonna help you get better and better at that. So this is this idea that um, kids, we value process writing. When you're in an IB diploma program, or you're in college, or you're in high school. In fact, almost all the essays my kids write um, in high school, unless they're doing state test practice, is process. It's assigned on Monday, and it's due the following Monday. They, now, <coughs> full disclosure, my kids mostly write it as a, in an on-demand way on Sunday night from 10 to midnight, right? But it's a sign as a process piece. But the skills of being a good on-demand writer, being able to just plop out your ideas is really valuable. So I could say, can you believe the state of Ohio doesn't give us time to write? This is unfair. Let's change the laws. And in fact, we might believe that have kids do that when they're writing the take a stand unit. But we can also say that it's actually really good to be able to do an on-demand piece. 
It will save your butt the rest of your life if you get pretty good at this. You know, grown-ups need to use this skill all the time. It's really helpful for kids to know. A quick note about opinion writing. I meant to say this when we came back from break. Matt asked about this. Um, uh, we do want kids to take a stand on the opinion writing, not be neutral. So you also have to teach kids, I know you might not care about water bottles versus plastic bottles, but when you take the state test, Ohio really wants you to just pick one and go for it. So if you're stuck and you don't really care, pick the first position and write about that one. Don't spend any time being like, well, oh, I don't know, should there be zoos or should there not be zoos? Actually, I don't really care. I hate this test. Like, just saying, like, sometimes you have to pick an opinion and fake your way like you care about it. But you know how to do that because you know how to make a T-chart and gather evidence and make that thesis statement that shares, even if it's not something that you desperately believe in, chocolate milk or no zoos or yes to water bottles. <coughs> you have the skills to write an on-demand piece that shows that you can do that work. Okay, so I, we are gonna have to go back to writing time in just a minute, but I just wanna share one other thing that's here. Um, if you notice gaps, and you're like, ooh, I've been signing, you know, X, Y, and Z, but we haven't been doing much of elemental P, or you have kids that you know would benefit from practice, I wanted to shout out really quick. I think probably everyone knows Newzilla. Everyone knows Commonlit. I saw somebody using ReadWorks earlier. But I did scan illegally a bunch of um, good short stories and readings and chapters from books and picture books. Oh, here's Stephen. This is actually from Teaching Here. Here's part of Wilma Unlimited. There's Fox, the picture book that you guys are reading, typed up. Uh, Bring My Read, the picture book. Those shoes, the other sign, the gaming tree. So if you're ever like, I need a text to try tomorrow. Um, these are all different lengths, all different reading levels, uh, but I just sort of collect these. So if you go into the deck, you'll be able to just check these out and use them. Um, sometimes people just decide to take the whole thing and print it, so then you can like look through. You know, most of you are not ever going to use House on Mango Street. That's way more of six and seven. But all of you might consider using each kindness, especially if you read it at the beginning of the year and it's a really familiar book, you know, to have kids practice some literary essay stuff. So that's a resource that's there for you, along with all those other, you know, um, Smithsonian tween. If you haven't seen Smithsonian Institution, has a really great news that does the same thing that um, Reworks the Newzilla does, which is um, sort by Lexile. So Smithsonian Teen is another great source. So lots of great um, resources out there for us to use. Okay, so let's pop in. We've done number one, we've done number two. Number three is to talk about stamina and volume. So I just want to give us a little bit of partner time before we go back to our work time again. And if you can, if you have a copy of the um, If Then book, grab the If Then book for a minute. Um, the If Then is a professional book inside the units. And um, if you, the first three quarters of this book are extra units to teach. Um, um, and, and so there'll be ideas there of things you want to teach. But past that section in the table of contents, Jill, I'm going to grab yours because you're in exactly the right place is a long list of a bunch of scenarios. If, blah, 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 then, yada, yada, yada. Right? So I'm going to go to the opinion writing if thens and read some of these. If the writer is struggling to elaborate. If the writer's evidence feels free-floating or disconnected from the argument. If the writer struggles with spelling. If the writer has a limited repertoire of revision strategies. So I'm just noting all the if-then scenarios here. So this lists them, but if you go further in to the very back of the book, you'll see that these are all presented in chart format in the if-then book. And this chart is now a PDF in the online resources. So Josh doesn't have this book, but if he goes to the fourth grade online resources, 
He can download the informational writing if then um, hits. All of us can. And we can keep them with us as we lesson plan. But I want to note that some of the things that are here um, uh, focus on volume and stamina. And I want to, let me just ask for a quick show of hands, this is not for a grade. How many folks are using the word volume in writing workshop already? How many folks are using the word stamina? Okay, so we so we built that stamina and now we need to match it with some volume. And in fact, if you go into the uh, a guide to the writing workshop, um, Teachers College actually recommends that you have kids a couple times a year count how many words they're writing in 30 minutes so that they're actually tracking their volume and thinking like, huh, I was quiet and it didn't bother anyone, but I only wrote 92 words. And really lifting up uh, the amount of, um, of writing that you can do. And we have a double-edged sword in this. I'm going to the last bullet because some kids are highly motivated by like, we're building salmon and we're moving something up a chart and we're seeing that. And for other kids, that's highly stressful. They're like, I'm the only one that doesn't seem to be able to concentrate or crack the hundred word mark or do whatever it is. So I want you to think really carefully about the whole class ways to tackle volume and stamina. And then sometimes this might come with conferring. So then I'm gonna layer in one ugly other piece, which is, and don't forget that for all of your kids, this volume and stamina is connected to being on a device. So make sure your kids know how to shrug their shoulders and roll their neck when they're losing their focus so that they can stay at the computer. Make sure they know how to close their eyes, look away, focus on something else, and then turn back to the screen. You know, you do not refocus by closing your eyes at the screen and then opening your eyes at the screen. You have to teach them how to open their eyes, looking away from the screen, and then come back to the screen so that they're still developing brains actually get the respite it needs so that they can stay at the computer longer. Okay, so we're only going to spend about five minutes thinking about volume and stamina. Look at the resources that you have. I'll pull up a, a, the page number in a guide too in a minute and have a chat with other people. How can you be talking, working, cheerleading, volume and stamina more for your writers in the next 30 instructional days? Um, that there was a great piece in, um, in the how-to book. It's actually on the Teachers College website. And so you could, and we should all be on the readingandwritingproject.org site. You want to create a login in the upper right-hand side. Once you create that, you'll start getting blasts from Columbia College when new things become available. So this is by Colleen Cruz. She wrote many of the units. Um, so here's her insights on increasing volume. I also dropped it into the PowerPoint right here. So when you go on to um, uh, MV Feb 14 materials and you're on slide 27, it'll be there. But I also want to do a shout out for one of my all time favorite blogs. Again, you might be like, no more inputs. But twowritingteachers.org is a really awesome site, and they also have um, uh, a fabulous um, post on, um, on increasing volume with tons and tons of ways to leverage um, what you're always, already doing to um, support our kids in writing longer and writing more, increasing their stamina and increasing their volume. So I'll also um, cut and paste this article um, so that you have access to them both. Um, so a quick um, share out, and one thing I want to be really conscientious of as we start to do these share outs is that um, I am 
lovingly trying to push you just to even change the language of how you talk about this stuff. Instead of saying, you need to be quiet, we have six more minutes left. Really shifting to saying, writers, we're working on our stamina. If you are at 20 minutes um, already distracted, use one of our techniques to refocus, right? So that you're helping them recognize, like it's not a behavior that you're the boss of, it's a task they're getting better at using an anchor chart or a strategy or a tool. So we really want to shift just talking about stamina and volume instead of how many words does it have to be? How many paragraphs or pages? Instead saying, writers, growing your volume is critically important. So while I can sometimes answer that question, sometimes the... Um, Right answer is as much as you can write in 45 minutes. And really being clear with kids that like sometimes the um, stamina number is chosen for you. And sometimes the volume number isn't chosen for you. It's as much as you can get in. So just that language feels important. Other insights or ideas about volume or stamina? that you're thinking about. How about working with kids with IEPs around volume and stamina? Can we grab some ideas about maybe for kids for whom this is hard work? I'm wondering, I'm thinking about, I have a student who... I have a student who sits on a chair. And that can be a huge help. You're noticing that your body greatly contributes to your stamina. P.S. That's true for everyone, not just him. So if you don't have wiggly chairs for everyone, do your kids know to shake out their wrists, shrug their shoulders, right? Do the muscle moves. Cross the midline three times. All of that, if I don't have wiggly chairs for everyone, but we know our bodies are a factor, what else can kids do to make sure that they are building stamina for their bodies, not just their fingers and their brains? And it's all great. Yeah. Yeah. Concrete tools that do that. Cheap kitchen timers, as long as they're not going tick, 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 tick. Yeah. Yep. Hourglasses, which really come in like every increment. I feel like you can buy buy a set of 10 that's like five minutes, eight minutes, 10 minutes, 12 minutes, so that kids can grow their stamina over time. Also, the idea that, like, I'm going to go eight minutes, stretch, move, get a drink of water, and then come back and go eight minutes more. Mm -hmm. um, they know that it's dark, it's kind of it. So I was in a great high school classroom last week with one of my favorite, favorite teachers who I've known since she was a first year teacher. And she actually has mapped out how to write an essay in 30 minutes. Minute one, think, don't write. Just think about the topic. Brainstorm, let your mind dance around. Minute two, pick up your pen, write something on the piece of paper. Sketch out your thesis statement, make a T chart, make a list, use boxes and bullets, gather your text evidence. By minute five, start typing. Minute 15, look at your notes again. What are you forgetting? What are you distracted by? Blah, blah, blah. You know, minute 25, time to start editing. You know, do kids know that that's what they're supposed to do? 
Have we, or have we just been like, everyone, turn, start with your thesis, raise your hand when you're done, and we'll all move on when everyone's done. Yeah, that's not that great. You know, that can't be where we are if we want kids to really be able to know in their head, like, wait, I think I create a thesis statement, okay, I write it down, I teach hard, or I box and bullet, I gather some evidence, yeah. That's something that you can share. So I have several I students in my class. Yeah. They have over a page of everything. And in that time, they have the ELA session. They'll do all their brainstorming and everything on paper. And I'm like, OK, you've got 10 minutes. And they have you even started the face. Yeah. And then they freak out. Mm -hmm. OK, I'm doing sand. <laughs> Crystals. It's another crystal in my life. Anchor chart. No, I'll put it in the drive. There's not any direct content on that, so that will see up here and test it. I don't know. <laughs> That's a don't ask, don't tell one for me too. Um, yeah. I, I honestly don't know, of course I'm saying don't ask, don't tell, like I don't want to be in trouble with the state of Ohio, like coming to the Vejay family and taking me away and, you know, um, handcuffs. Um, I, I actually think whether it can be up or not, I'm actually thinking Crystal didn't do this, but I'm thinking about how for kids, I would maybe do this on chart paper that is graph paper, chart paper, so that I could literally show one row, then five rows, so that like actually it, it, the length of time is visually represented, not just listed as well. Like kids need to know, like PS, this is how you should use the time. Because they spend a lot of time lock, stock, and you know, barrel, and that's not what, you know, what it should feel like. And that's another plus of workshop instruction. You know, when we're teaching using workshop, kids don't spend a lot of time waiting for other kids to finish so that we can move on. That's not part of workshop. <coughs> but if we're doing test prep where kids are waiting, then we're inadvertently sending them the message that like, you wait for me before you go on. I don't want to see why, why are you not on page two, you know? And all of a sudden, it's just like, wait, is this the time where I'm supposed to move ahead, or am I supposed to wait for you here? So this could be a great thing. OK, last thing I want us to do is just move into work time for a few more minutes to think about a couple priorities. Maybe the most important thing you need to do is shift your language. Maybe the most important thing you need to do is um, Focus on stamina and volume. Maybe the most important thing you need to do is read unit four, you know, or, or read the fourth grade unit. I just want to share an idea that's come up from doing this workshop multiple times. And this is one of my favorite anchor charts in the, in the units of study. I use it in Crystal Williams' ninth grade classroom in um, CMSD. Um, it's how to embed quotes into an essay. Sort of the, it really breaks down the process of how you do this. Um, using the book Fox, which is a really <coughs> super creepy picture book. Did you guys finish reading it? Yeah, it's like super creepy and emotional. Um, so uh, I want to note that to really help this happen for kids, you and you alone are not enough. So I previewed this when we were together earlier. Like, you might have to ask, like, Instead of just having an inspirational quote up in the gym and being like, hey, can you have a Kobe Bryant quote up in the gym? Because a lot of kids are caring about that right now. You might actually want to have an embedded quote anchor chart up in the gym that says, Kobe Bryant was one of my favorite athletes. When he said, comma, quote, quit, quitters never win and winners never quit, parentheses, quote, I knew he was going to be an inspiration for me. To me. Now instead, in the gym we have quitters never win and winners never quit. But just that tiny bit of asking the people, you can say like, I'll make it up for you. Just tell me three things that you love that you can attribute to someone. 
And then kids starting to see like, wait, I, what's the chart in the gym? And just being and asking the PE teacher or the art teacher or the librarian to sort of show, oh yeah, I love to quote my favorite athletes. Oh yeah, oh my gosh, it's it's um, is March Women's History Month? It's Women's History Month. I've been thinking so much about the wisdom that I've learned from my favorite female artists. So I just want to write and share a few of those things with you. Like, it doesn't have to be a lesson. It just has to show kids that people quote things all the time, not just when they're taking the state test. You could build this into a morning meeting. You could build this into some homework. But the idea of you felt like, my kids just aren't good at this, don't feel like the only time they're going to learn to do it is with you. Create some other opportunities, momentum for this to happen. So, you know, here's how to bring quotes into an essay, a bunch of ideas around that. You could also, do, this, is an, um, this is one of the best anchor charts ever. How to make a literary essay. Starts with an introduction, has body paragraphs, ends with a conclusion. And then really walks kids through what those things look like with these amazing little pictures. So this is from the fifth grade literary essay unit. We all should have access to it now. Even Josh, the sub. Sorry, Josh. You know, but now that we've, we've all gotten online, is this something that you want to actually be, you know, have other people be talking about? Can this, a science person help you out with this? You know, can the librarian help you out with this? You know, please, would you be willing to have kids write collections of favorite book essays so that they could practice writing about reading in the library, but in like this hyper joyful way, not in a way where they're like, oh, even library feels like test prep. So our last bit of work that I want folks to do is think about what are your two priorities? What are the two things you're going to walk away for sure doing after our time together today? Talk with a friend, write them down, put a post-it note in the book, print it out, send yourself an email. So let's just get planned for the next seven minutes so that you're really not like, there were 25 ideas and I don't know what I'm doing next. You know, figure out which ones you are going to do next and write them down. Again, post-it notes are here. You have online resources. You have anchor charts. You have this PowerPoint. What are, the, what are the two things you're actually going to do on Tuesday? I want to give us time with our exit ticket. I appreciate people are asking, like literally folks are like, we're going to teach this half, we're going to teach Bend 1 and 2 with the fourth grade literary essay. If you're moving into some of this teaching, be sure to get with other folks who are at your grade level or in your building to be like, what anchor chart are you using? Would you, I said to this team and they're like, no, our kids don't get along. But I was like, there is power in being like, you know what? Let's have, we're not going to have an, um, an OSP. Let's have a volume and stamina, you know, assembly instead where we're going to talk about like how much no. popcorn can we pop to unpack volume and what volume looks like and how you grow your volume the same way little popcorn becomes much bigger when you're ten when you're giving it what it needs which is heat and you will grow your volume when we give you what you need um, you know there's so many ways we can do this that are drudgery and ways we can do this that are joyful. And this is a relationship-oriented, joyful-oriented approach um, from Teachers College. So um, there's our bit.ly link. Please hop online on your phone or your Chromebook, bit.ly, feb14mb, capital F, capital M, capital V, and it'll take you right to the exit ticket. And there's just a couple questions, including like, what will you do next? What are you thinking about? But please also get your questions and your wonderings out there. Check in with your colleagues in real life. Check on the Facebook page and know that Crystal and I will be back on March 20th. So as you fill out your exit ticket, you might be like, hey, can you talk more about this or share more about that? Because you'll actually see us again in our